Welcome back, America. I'm Hugh Hewitt. Now, listen up, parents. This is the most important segment I have done in a long time. Jonathan Haidt is an American social psychologist. He's also a professor at more universities than I can name. His resume takes too long. But he's got a new book out, or coming out next year, called The Anxious Generation. But he has right now an article available at The Atlantic, Get Bones Out of School Now. Jonathan, thank you so much for joining me. It's great to see you. Welcome. Thanks, you. It's great to be back with you. I know I'm going to be reading The Anxious Generation, and I will talk about The Anxious Generation when it comes out, but let's get a preview of The Anxious Generation and remembering the Luntz Law, which you must say The Anxious Generation seven times for anyone to order and pre-order The Anxious Generation. So let's get it done on The Anxious Generation. When's it coming out? What's it about? <laughs> I guess I only have to say it one more time, The Anxious Generation. That's right. Um, <clears throat> so uh, it'll come out in late March, uh, March 26th. and. Um, the book is about a gigantic mystery that hit us in the 2010s, which is all of a sudden, um, young people were very depressed and anxious. And it, it started very suddenly around 2012, and it didn't really hit the millennials. It hit uh, kids who were born after 1995, which is Gen Z. Um, and so what happened? Why did they suddenly get so anxious and depressed? And the book tells the story of how we transitioned from what you might call a play-based childhood, which is what children need. It's what all mammals have. Uh, kids need to play to wire up their brains. We, we gradually cracked down on free play. We prevented our kids from going out. We were too afraid that things would happen to them in the real world. At the same time, the virtual world opened up and sucked them in. So we developed what I'm calling a phone-based childhood. Uh, and especially 2010 to 2015, that's when teens traded in their flip phones which are not bad for you, for smartphones, which are. So it was the move from play-based childhood to phone-based childhood, and boom, the kids, and especially the girls on social media, boom, they get depressed and anxious beginning in 2013. That's what the book is about. Now, Jonathan, I have five grandchildren under the age of 11. They're spread all over the country, and I am blessed to be able to see them very closely, and their parents are good parents, and those who are old enough don't get near cell phones. And Dad is hell on wheels right. on video games. So I'm all in line with this, but I still send him your article because, you know, these kids go to other kids' houses and they see other kids with phones and you really can't escape the net that is catching this generation. So let's retreat to the Atlantic article. I'll return to the anxious generation okay. next, but the Atlantic article makes a statement of fact. Phones are bad for kids and a declaration of policy. Get phones out of school now. They are both 100% correct, both as a matter of fact and as a matter of policy suggestion. How did you arrive at those conclusions? So I've been studying, <clears throat> I've been studying the mental health crisis for a long time, at least intensively since 2018. Uh, so I've been focused on on what's, you know, how social media in particular, but the whole sort of phone-based life is is blocking child development, messing up all kinds of developmental processes. But I, I only turned my attention to schools after I gave a talk at my old high school. Uh, I was invited back in Scarsdale, New York. I gave a talk there in 2019. And the principal told me, you know, the kids are depressed and anxious. And they're that way when they came in from middle school. They're already addicted to their phones and depressed and anxious. Then by coincidence, I was invited to speak at my old middle school. And I, the principal said the same thing there. She said, when the kids arrive in sixth grade, a lot of them are already addicted to their phones and anxious. So I began thinking about what's happening in school. And when you look at the research on this, phones, they really disrupt attention. The kids are on their phones all the time in school. If they've got it in their pocket, they're texting each other. Uh, you know, Most schools say they ban phones. All they mean is the rule is you can't look at your phone during class. You have to keep it in your pocket. That's like running a heroin rehab clinic and saying to the addicts, you know, you cannot shoot up while you're in this clinic. You must keep your needle and your heroin in your pocket. Of course, they're going to go to the bathroom and shoot up. So, um, so I realized school is the best chance we have to keep kids off of devices for seven hours a day. And then you know what happens? They talk to each other. They laugh. When schools go phone free, they find the hallways are much noisier between classes because kids are actually talking. Whereas otherwise, you, you know, you walk into a normal school, they're just doing this all the time. They don't talk to each other. Yeah. And then I can't imagine what a high school class. cafeteria is like now, Jonathan. I, I haven't been in one in a long time. And we went to modular scheduling. I'm older than you are in the 70s. And so you ended up sitting around playing cards all day in the cafeteria when they screwed it up. 
but it was playing cards, which is an interactive, full of sarcasm, sneers, jibes, the kind of things that you learn in high school, but fun. I bet you that's every right. kid is on a cell phone now. Mm -hmm. Well, that's right. <clears throat> that, that's true in, in uh, middle schools and high schools. It's even true at the university. I teach here at New York University. Uh, my undergraduates tell me that they go to lunch in the cafeteria and they sit with other kids, but everyone has their phone out. Everyone has their phone out. And so even if you're talking to someone, they're going to move away. Oh, I got something. That, so nobody's paying full attention to anybody. They're not developing the skills and especially they're not developing the close friendships. That's the most important thing for human happiness, especially for teenagers, is close friendships, a group that does things together. If you're each on your own phones commenting on each other's posts, there's really no benefit from that. Uh, Jonathan, who disagrees? Now, I after I first highlighted your article, I got a number of people saying the problem is that, that parents want their kids to have phones yeah, and yeah. they won't allow schools to ban them. Would you respond to that, please? Yes. So that is true. That is the problem. Uh, is that many parents object. Uh, now, for, let's start from the beginning here. Talk to teachers. The teachers, almost 100%, the teachers are horrified by what's happening. It falls on them to be the phone police. So the teachers all want the phones out of school. They don't see any benefit. They see the devastation to learning and social life. So, so there's a desire to get them out. And I asked the principals at my two schools, well, why don't you just you know, tell kids to lock up their phones in the morning? What, you know, why can't we just put them in phone lockers? And they said, oh, you know, parents get upset. And nowadays, especially, oh, parents get upset because they think, well, what if there's a school shooting? Uh, I need to get in touch with my child all the time. I need to be able to text them while they're in class. I need to be in touch. Um, so that right there is actually part of the problem is kids need, a, it's healthier for them to have a lot more independence. But I understand the fear about school shootings. We live in a country in which this happens horrifically. Uh, and all of us as parents, we are attuned to any threat, no matter how small it is. You can't say to people, oh, it's just tiny. But here's the thing I, I would like parents to think about. Let's imagine the worst happens. Let's imagine that there is a shooter in your child's school. Now, let's imagine there's two different schools your kid could be in. In one school, everyone's got a phone. And so as soon as they call lockdown, as soon as they say there's something wrong, everyone pulls out their phone. Everyone's calling their parents. Everyone is, is, is communicating with their parents. The parents are all rushing to school, okay, in the cars. So that's school one. Uh, school two, nobody has a phone except for the teachers and the principals. And so they're coordinating what to do, and the kids are paying attention and doing what they're supposed to do. Which school is the safer one? Which school is the one that's more likely to get through it with fewer injuries? I don't see any benefit to having kids having phones in school. There is no benefit. I mean, as a matter of fact, you argue this through the five levels of school policy on phone in the Atlantic article, which I posted on my account over at the site formerly known as Twitter. And people can go read it. It's online. It's for free. Call it, I'm going to call it Twitter. I will not be pushed into calling that thing X. It's Twitter. All right. Well, it's over on Twitter and I've posted it and it's free. It's outside of the paywall. And Arthur Brooks and John Haight are, uh, Haight are two reasons why you should subscribe to the Atlantic. And I think it's the last magazine in America. By the way, have you ever done a podcast with Arthur? I would, I'd pay cash money for oh that. My God, I love Arthur. I love Arthur. Um, and can I just put in a plug for his book, uh, From Strength to Strength? I'm reading it right now. Anybody over 45, read this book about how to adapt to getting older. But okay, back to our regularly scheduled. Yeah, no, book, I, I agree uh, with the commercial. Discussion. Arthur's been on the show. He's a good friend. And at my 45th college reunion, he was the speaker and name checked me. So I had the esteem of all my, my alums because Arthur Brooks, who's fabulous and about aging, is great. But if you two got together and talked about cell phones on happiness and cell phones, particularly on the happiness of young people, it would be powerful. And he's a man of the center right. And you're a man of the center left. He's a very devout religious Catholic. I believe you're a non-believer. If you got together, you've got the whole world covered, basically. And I would love for this message to get out there. Is there, and you'll be honest with me, is there a good argument for phones in school? I know you'll know if there is one. Is there one? Is there a good argument for phones in school? Um, yeah. Well, there are some benefits in that uh, the main one is that there has been this long push to bring technology into schools, which was a mistake. It's, it's not clear that more phones and computers in schools actually helps learning. But the kids all have phones. And so many teachers have adapted lesson plans that involve the phone. They think this makes it more relevant to them. So I don't doubt that some of these lesson plans are good. I mean, the fact that you can actually do research during class, you know, using your phone. Um, so there may be some benefits, but you have to look, what are the benefits to education? What are the costs? 
anytime a kid pulls out their phone to do the to do what you think they're doing, they're not doing what you think they're doing. If they pull out the phone, they're checking their texts and they're responding to them. They're distracted. And so especially in uh, before the frontal cortex is really developed, which is basically <laughs> before your mid 20s. Um, but in particular, in early puberty, mid puberty, in that region, the, the multitasking, the inability to focus on one thing actually seems to disrupt brain development so that kids will later find it hard to focus. So sure, there are some benefits, but the costs so vastly outweigh the benefits that I think we just need a blanket policy, phone-free school. You come to school, they're useful for getting to and from school. Um, they have to communicate with their parents at pickup. I understand that. But you get to school, you put in a phone locker is the best way. The yonder pouches also work, but the you, you know the kids, you go on YouTube, you'll find a video, five ways to open your yonder pouch. So the, my, my daughter's school does it, middle school. They're definitely helpful, they're good, but uh, a phone locker is the best. Um, we need phone-free schools, and that will improve mental health, social development, and learning. Uh, you know, Jonathan, I'm, after the break, I'm going to come back and talk with you about the long-term consequences of addiction as a young person to anything, whether it's phones, drugs, alcohol, whatever, pornography. During the break, we're going to talk about online pornography in young men and what the addiction is going to do there. That's the teaser to make sure everyone listens to the full podcast. But, but, but. Has any school district that read your article put up a policy that bans them from campus? Which to me, the pickup stuff is nonsense. I, you know, we picked up kids for, I don't know how many parenting years, I've got like 30. Mm -hmm. And my, my kids get picked, my grandkids get picked up. I just don't believe that's uh, uh, probative or dispositive. Does, has any school board stood up and said, no, not now, not ever, never on our campus? Mm -hmm. So it's, it's happening. Um, my article just came out uh, three or four months ago, so I don't know of any districts that have definitely put in place plans to start right now, but I hear that many are discussing it. Um, and there are already many schools, especially private schools. Private schools tend to have more flexibility. They can make policies more easily than public. A lot of private schools have gone phone free. I have yet to hear of a school that went phone free and found that it made anything worse. Whereas you hear ah. all these stories, they go phone free and suddenly it's like, Amazing. People talk to each other. Students are learning. I'm going to talk with Jonathan Height during the break about young men, especially in porn on devices. And then we're going to come back after the break and talk some more about the school board near you. Stay tuned. Jonathan Height returns. The new book coming out is The Anxious Generation. The Atlantic article is Get Phones Out of School Now. I'll be right back. Welcome back. I've got Jonathan Height now uh, in the off section. He'll be on the podcast, Jonathan. Will the anxious generation cover pornography and young men and the devices that brings it to them every day, every hour? Yes, uh, I do have a section on that in the book. So here's the way to think about it. <clears throat> um, the evidence, the, the psychological evidence that published studies uh, are strongest on social media harming girls, especially in middle school. That's the greatest source of damage. And when I started writing the book, I thought it was gonna be mostly about social media. And I didn't know what to say about boys when I started. Boys are also doing badly, but their increases in depression and anxiety are not quite as high as the girls. They are way up, but not quite as much as the girls. So I wasn't sure what to say about boys because I couldn't, I, I couldn't scientifically link social media to boys' problems. But as I wrote the book, and as I realized, this isn't just about social media. This is about growing up online, which is like growing up on Mars. You, you can't, children cannot grow up on Mars. They would, the gravity would not be right. It would warp everything about their development. They'd have all kinds of damage. Growing up online is like growing up on Mars. And what I realized uh, as I wrote the book is that for boys, what's been happening is a general retreat from the real world since the 1970s. Uh, you know, men and boys used to dominate in many ways, but beginning in the 70s, boys have been retreating. They're doing worse and worse in school. Girls are doing better and better. And that's wonderful. The girls are going up. But if the girls are doing better than the boys and the girls are going to college, the boys aren't, there's going to be, there's an awful lot of wasted talent and an awful lot of women who can't find a man. Uh, that's already happening. So boys are retreating from work, uh, from school, from work, and now from family and marriage and even sex. Um, at the same time, they're moving into the virtual world. They're spending more and more time on video games. About 10% of them are either addicted or have problematic views. Video games wow. are not generally bad. Most boys are fine, they're a lot of fun, but a large number, I mean, 10% of boys is a huge number to lose to video games. And many parents listening are gonna recognize this. 
Um, so what? Uh, so video games and then also porn. Those two. Um, uh, um, there is now a lot of evidence. Well, it's hard to collect evidence on the effects of porn on teenagers because you can't really study children and give them pornography. But what appears to be happening is that the the old style of pornography, like a Playboy magazine, you know, a kid, a boy looks at beautiful naked women. He has to imagine himself having sex with her. Uh, that doesn't appear to be harmful. But what happened once everybody got a smartphone? and high-speed internet is boys now have access to incredibly graphic, explicit pornography. Any moment at Pornhub, there's no age check. You can just, anyone can go online whenever they want. Um, and growing up watching high definition, hardcore porn tells you how to do it. It tells you what women are like. It tells you what they want, which is entirely wrong. Um, and it does- No, Jonathan, that I have one written... suggestion for you. Uh, go find a bunch of serious Catholic priests and ask what they hear in the confessional. I have a, a friend, Archbishop Chuck mm -hmm. Hughes, retired now in Philadelphia, who has told me it is absolutely shocking to hear about porn addiction in the confessional. And he doesn't know what to do about it either. Uh, we're going to come back from break. I just want to warn parents about that off the air. It's a little bit explicit for on the air, but, but you can hear it off the air in the podcast. Coming right back with Jonathan after this. Stay tuned. Welcome back, America. I'm Hugh Hewitt. Jonathan Haidt has got a new book coming out, The Anxious Generation. But before you read The Anxious Generation, you can get ready to, you can pre-order it today. Get Phones Out of School Now is his article in The Atlantic. And Jonathan, by way of introduction, I've been lucky in friends my entire life. And if, if you drew a diagram of my friends, two thirds of the people I would define as close friends, those people about whom you would feel great loss if they were to die or depart from your life, are from junior high and high school. Because you spend mm -hmm. such an inordinate amount of time with them, that time which eventually goes into your spouse or your partner is spent with your friends talking about trying to find a spouse or a partner or doing whatever goofy things boys and girls do. This phone uh, phenomenon is destroying those friendships. They're, they're going to have friends, not as many, not as good. They're going to have fewer and more of them will be later in life and not long term. Am I guessing wrong or is that true? No, that's absolutely right. If we look at what does it mean to live in the virtual world versus the real world, let's look at communities in both places. In the real world, there aren't that many people around you in middle school. I mean, you've got a group of friends. And if you have a fight, you got to make up with them because you can't just leave your group of friends yeah, every day and make a new one. So the real world experience forces you to work through problems. You spend a lot of time talking about crazy stuff, you do things, you take risks together. And especially actually the risk taking turns out to be actually very important in binding people together, physical risk taking. So that's the way kids are always raised in, in, in groups that became very tightly bonded. But now that kids are growing up in virtual communities, well, the virtual community, just press a button and you're out of there. You can join, you can leave, there's no commitment. People often don't even know your name, you have a fake name. So these are very superficial connections. Now, I don't doubt that some of them get some depth, but when kids don't grow up with the kind of experiences you and I had, they're not going to have tight relationships when they're older. They're not going to have those close friends from middle school and high Jonathan, school. Jonathan, expand and on. They don't have the practice. Boy, you just, something you said, said resonates with me. Shared risk taking. That would explain why the band of brothers effect in the military is so profound. It would also explain why the most knuckleheaded things my kids did and that I did are the things that we talk about forever with our friends or with our family. What, yes, what that's is, right. Is that, is that statistically true? I mean, do you have research on risk-taking yes. builds bonds? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. And I'm so glad you brought this up because this is the other half of the story. This is not just about technology. It's also about the loss of play. The best kind of play, the healthiest play for human children is outdoor physical play in mixed age groups with some physical risk. That's the way mammals need to play to wire themselves up and to learn how to judge risk for themselves. Now, especially with boys, girls tend to play more one-on-one. -on -one. Boys play in groups and these groups, they either break up for sports or they do things together, often knuckleheaded things, but they're testing their limits. They're learning about the physical world. They're learning their capacities. And in the process, they are creating an incredibly tight bond. I remember when my friends and I, we weren't even doing anything. We were hanging out in the, you know, at night in the village that I grew up in, in the town I grew up in. And somebody had opened a car door, I think, and the, but the police came screaming in. They saw a car door open. We all ran away. Like we hadn't committed any crime, but we, right, we still talked about that. The time we ran from the police and one of us was picked up. Anyway, it was, it was exciting. Um, so boys yeah. in particular, that's the way boys bond. They, not by talking face to face. Boys have adventures shoulder to shoulder. 
as Richard Reeves says in his wonderful book of boys and men. That's fab. You know, I did, I hadn't thought of that. But now to go back to the problem, when you introduce the ubiquitous cell phone, especially among young girls, and we're going to continue this conversation afterwards. So I'll be on the iTunes podcast. This is so bad for girls in what sixth through eighth grade, and I can only especially, imagine because yeah. boys just you know throw balls at each other's head. Girls get mean, right? That's right. Yes. Yes. So it's horrible. So. If, if, if we could do one thing, it would be to get these phones the hell out of middle school. That is, don't have them in the school, but also parents, if you're listening to me, just don't give your kid a smartphone until high school. I, if we could make that the national norm, that in middle school, you can have a dumb phone, you can have a flip phone, you can text, but but don't. nobody should give their kid a smartphone as the first phone, and no one should give a smartphone before high school, because it's, it's seventh grade is the worst year for bullying. Seventh and eighth grade are the worst years for bullying, and that's especially true for girls. Girls, boys do physical bullying, so that actually goes down when you're on phones. But girls have always done relational aggression. They damage each other's relationships. That's always been true. And now with smartphones, it's so much easier to do it, and you can do it on weekends all the time. So the girls are really going through hell uh, because of this. Um, uh, so yeah, the, so the social media is especially messing up the girls. Um, and boys, you know, you mentioned just one final point on the risk taking, because you asked, is there evidence of this? Boys used to like risk more than girls, and boys used to take more risk than girls, and boys used to get injured more than girls. They would go to the hospital more. Now, of course, we don't want boys going to the hospital, but something weird began happening around 2010, which is the rates of risk taking, risk seeking, liking of risk for boys has gone down and down and down. The injury rates have gone down and down and down. And so boys now look like girls from 15 years ago. Boys now go to the hospital the same amount as men in their 50s. And that was never the case until recently. So of course, okay, when we come back, injured. when we come back, go put your pre-order in right now for the anxious generation. You can do that at Amazon, the anxious generation. Remember that, go get it. Jonathan will be back when the book comes out. In our last segment, we're going to talk about projection. What do we project this generation is going to be like at 30, 40, 50, and if they live long enough, 60 and 70. I think it's a horror show, but I'll ask Jonathan what his research is showing us and what a preview of the anxious generation is. The, uh, the podcast is over at Highly Concentrated You at iTunes. And thank you all for listening. Thank you, Adam, Dwayne, and Harley. We'll continue this conversation on the other side, Jonathan. For another time. So I'm back with Jonathan Haidt talking about his new book, The Anxious Generation, which will come out in the spring, and about his article, which is out now and online, Get Phones Out of Schools Now. Jonathan, we don't have any time limit here. I want to hear what your, there, there are different scenarios whenever anyone projects the future, right? I think the Cleveland Browns may win the Super Bowl by the time I die, but that's an optimistic projection. The reality is they haven't even been close since I've been an adult, so I'm not really. So there's a projection of what's going to happen to this generation that is hooked on phones that is the worst case and a best case. Would you tell us what the spectrum of probabilities and possibilities are in your view? Mm, that's a, wow, that's a great question. Um, and uh, let me let me just think that through for a moment. I think what we what we know is the rates of anxiety, depression, self harm, suicide. Um, we know that kids born after 1995, that is Gen Z, is much more anxious, depressed, and fragile than previous generations. The most optimistic scenario is that they uh, overcome a lot of this, and they're they're unlikely to. They're unlikely to come down to the levels of previous generations because you go through these experiences in childhood and, and, and uh, uh, young adulthood, they change your brain development. So there's likely to be some permanent mark, but it, it can be better. Therapy can help. So um, the most optimistic scenario is that we rise up as a nation. It's not just America, actually. This is happening all over the developed world. We rise up as a global population and say enough is enough. Stop it. Uh, we have norms about phones. We raise the age to 16 and have that be enforced. Um, and so at very least, the next generation, Gen Alpha, uh, will come out much healthier. That's our best case scenario. Uh, yeah, Jonathan, I, I when... Wanna, uh, go ahead. Oh, oh I, I guess I should have started with the worst case scenario so that I could end with the best case scenario, because the worst case scenario is pretty grim. Um, if we go on as we're going, and I hope we won't, but if we go on as we're going, what we now have 
is uh, something on the order of 30 or 40 percent of girls say they have an anxiety disorder. Um, interestingly, it's especially uh, secular liberal girls have the highest rates and religious conservative boys and girls have the lowest rates because they're more anchored in communities. But but all groups are rising on these problems. Um, they The problems may be permanent. That is, um, if you went through, especially puberty, early puberty on a phone and, and you developed anxiety um, and, and you have fragmented attention, difficulty concentrating, those changes may be permanent. We just don't know. Um, the oldest members of Gen Z are now about 27. And the reports I get from people in the business world, I work in a business school. I talk with a lot of business people. I ask them, how are your Gen Z employees? And uniformly, I get, I get despair. I get, oh, my God, they're impossible to work with. They're fragile. They don't do things on their own. They have to be told what to do. They have to be reassured about everything. I can't give feedback. I can't give honest feedback. They crumble. So uh, again, none of this is. What do you fault. stop? Pause there. Uh, what do you mean by fragility and crumbling? So a normal human being has skin, uh, and they can have thin skin or thick skin. And if you have thick skin, you don't get hurt. What if you have no skin? What if anything that touches you hurts you because you have no skin? Well, we've taught kids to respond to microaggressions. So, you know, my own kids are, uh, my wife is Korean American. My kids are visibly Asian mixed. You know, and if someone says, you know, where are you from? Or a kid said to my son the other day, are you, are you Japanese or Chinese? Um, but, you know, he didn't care. It doesn't offend him. But in many universities, students are taught, if someone says, where are you from? They mean you're not a real American. You should be harmed by it. You should feel upset by that. You've been marginalized. So in, in especially in progressive spaces, and the educational establishment, I think, has done a terrible job here, has really contributed to the fragilizing of, of, of children. Um, we are, we've raised a generation where we basically taught them the opposite of ancient wisdom. Ancient wisdom, the Stoics, the Buddhists, says you can't change the world to your liking. You have to adapt yourself to the world and learn to deal with it. And instead, we've told kids, no, no, you know, everyone has to adapt to you. Nobody can say anything. If you feel offended, then they have committed an aggression. And there has to be a bureaucratic, so it has to be a, a number you can call to report them. This makes it very difficult to work with some members of Gen Z. So the employment process- yeah, This is poor. fascinating. Is that going to be in the anxious generation? Because I've heard from employers um, so, about this. Yeah. A lot of that is in my previous book, The Coddling of the American Mind. Um, I don't go into that much in the anxious generation. In part, I just I want to keep that book less political because we live in such a culture war time that uh, you know if if uh, anyway I just I, I I didn't do a lot of the politics stuff in yeah. the anxious generation. Well, let me land the plane here in terms of the parent who wants to take away the phone from the child. They're persuaded. We've gotten to them. They don't have to wait for the anxious mind. They'll get it and they'll read it and they'll get smart. But they're they've made the commitment. They're going to put up with the with the blowback and there will be blowback. What is the payoff for them, Jonathan? Because they got to realize it's like there, there's going to be a tantrum, but the payoff is, I think, a happy life. If, if you and Arthur got together and said it, maybe school boards would believe you, but I think the payoff is a happy life if you're not addicted to phones. Okay. Yes, but before, I don't want people seeing as a black and white, I'm going to take my take the stuff away from my kid and then he'll be okay. I want parents to see this as kids need healthy friendships and connections. You don't want them totally disconnected, but you don't want them addicted either. So you definitely don't want to give a smartphone until high school. But whatever you do, you want to coordinate with other parents. If you can talk with the parents of your kids' friends, so because what we all crumble under is, mom, I, you know, everyone else has Instagram. I'm the only one who doesn't have it. Well, that's painful to hear when your kid says she's being isolated. So, so this is a collective action problem. I would say work with other parents. There's a great organization called Wait Until Eighth, which they try to get parents to sign a pledge that they won't give a smartphone until eighth grade. Unfortunately, they got the number wrong. It should be wait until ninth, actually. But it, 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 it's good as a way to coordinate. Um, so uh, you don't want your kid to be isolated. And so make sure that your kid has ways to spend time with other kids, has ways to communicate. Uh, you know, my children, they, they're able to use their computers to text, you know, before they, before they had smartphones. And even with smartphones, you know, we, we, it's limited, it used to be limited time that they had access to them, but they could use the computers to text. So you don't want to cut them off. Um, but over and over again, you find that when kids, uh, uh, when kids who, who were delayed in this, when they, their parents kept it away from them, they didn't like it at first. But after a few years, they look back and they say, 
that I, I'm really glad you did that. I look at what happened to yeah. all my friends. Are, are you friends with Malcolm Gladwell? I've met him a few times. I've done some. some okay. Well, I, I don't know him at all, but he worked to change in society. He got parents not to push their children to go to school early because he simply wrote a book which had an enormous impact oh, yeah. on people that you want to wait until they're uh, a year older than pushing them in a year younger for a variety of really changed the culture. Then I go back to Mothers Against Drunk Driving. I, you know, when I was 18 in Ohio, you could drink three, two beer. When I got to Massachusetts, you could drink anything. That's not possible because Mothers Against Drunk Driving got Congress to condition highway funding on raising the drinking age to 21. Are you optimistic about collective action, either by an individual like Malcolm or you, or an organization like MAD coming in on this? Because uh, you know some of the generation is currently wounded and they'll have to be repaired. Hopefully that will happen. Uh, I gotta come back with another question about anxiety drugs before you leave. But are you optimistic collective action is, is happening and is possible? Yes, I actually am optimistic and here's why. Um, social media is messing us up politically and there are all kinds of reforms we could do. And those are all political. The left wants one thing, the right wants another. Congress is not likely to act on things about identity verification, all sorts of things. But Congress people are most all parents. And there have been a whole bunch of bipartisan bills. Uh, there's a lot of support in Congress for doing something to protect children. Also, if you're trying to start a social movement and you have to persuade people to join you, you have to persuade people that there's a problem, well, then it's really hard to do. But everyone sees the problem. Parents are really upset by this. It's one of their top fears in parenting. So it's not that we have to persuade people to do something. It's that we have to just agree. What do we do? What do we do? So I'm hopeful that just as Malcolm, uh, he had that thing was about redshirting, I guess, it was you know, holding people back. Yeah. I'm hopeful that if I put out, you know, I say that, you know, there's three, there's three big things uh, that we can, that we can do that would really change things in a huge way. Number one, don't give a smartphone till high school. Uh, number two, no social media until 16, or at least high school, but 16, ideally, we should raise the age. So that's two. And then the third is phone free schools. If we do those three, that will really improve. They're still going to have social media at 16, but their brains are more developed. It won't be as damaging. And then there is a fourth which is vastly more time in free play in mixed age groups outdoors. We've got to let our kids out. Uh, in the book, I give suggestions. Oh, actually, if parents go to letgrow.org, letgrow.org. It's an organization I founded with Lenore Skenazy, who wrote the book Free Range Kids. We have all kinds of ideas for what parents oh. can do, what schools can do to, to safely give their kids time unsupervised. Playtime has to be unsupervised. If a parent is there, they're going to be playing referee, like, oh, no, you know, you shouldn't do that, Johnny. Like, no, let them have the fights. Let them argue about the rules. That's that's the most nutritious part of play is the conflict. So uh, uh, those are Jonathan, the four things. Do you believe in the efficacy? I can remember with crystal clarity 50 years ago, driver's ed, because it was so awful. Mm -hmm. But oh, yeah. you had to take it. Yeah. You had to do it. Do you believe in cell phone ed at 16 or 17 or I think driver's ed is at 15 and a half and it used to, it used to be, you know, a half century yeah. ago. Yes, I do believe in it. Um, that is, I'm inclined to not believe in it because a lot of my own research was on how our mind is divided into parts like a rider on an elephant and the rider is the conscious reasoning and the elephant is, is the emotions and the elephant's really in control. The elephant's much more powerful. And um, teaching usually just speaks to the rider, the reasoning, it doesn't do much. But actually, your point about driver's ed, I'm sure we both remember the staged car crash, crashes and the blood. Yes. I think some of them might have been yes. real. I can't remember if they were real or fake. I actually don't remember. But they were trying to speak to the, to the elephant. They were trying to speak to our intuitions. And so if, uh, if education about social media and, and, and digital life uh, has an emotional component, then I think it's likely to be effective. And I have heard of a couple of studies that did show effectiveness. So um, would, would an education course on its own have much effect? maybe, but but along with all these other measures and just delaying access, give the brain time to develop, um, then I think education would should be an important part of this, yes. All right, my last question has to do with pharmacological treatment of children with anxiety disorders. And I don't know if you've gotten there yet. My older brother, who I call Mycroft, because he's just like smarter than Vena. Yeah, just mm -hmm. so, so smart. But he's a retired toxicologist. And he said, you know, the one thing when we approve a drug we don't know about is long, long term. We don't do 40 year, 50 year longitudinal studies. If we start giving Xanax to children, 
and they never get off. I have no idea what that's going to do to their body chemistry. Are, are you in favor of that? Or uh, what is the, the height view of pharmacopoeia with children? Oh, so, right. We don't know the long-term view, even about birth control pills. It's now looking like, you know, girls have been on birth control. They're taking it very early. You're taking hormones. It's going to interfere with development. So for all these drugs, I, I would be wary of, of long-term use. Now, Xanax is for panic attacks. I myself have had a couple of periods of anxiety. I took benzodiazepines like Xanax. They're very helpful short-term. I'm not saying they shouldn't be used. But long-term, um, these drugs, we, we certainly want to find other ways. For anxiety, by far the best treatment is cognitive behavioral therapy. You learn to recognize distorted thoughts, like overgeneralizing, catastrophizing. You learn to recognize them and counteract them. That's what the coddling the American mind was about. My, my friend Greg Lukianoff, who learned CBT when he suffered from suicidal depression, he began to see that students on college campuses around 2014 were catastrophizing. Oh, you know, if Charles Murray comes to speak on campus, you know, people will die. Like, really? How will they die? They don't even have to go to the talk. Um, so, uh, so CBT is 100% healthy. It improves your thinking. There's no chemicals. It lasts, it lasts permanently, whereas the drugs only work when you're taking them. Um, so I, don't, I would never want to say to parents, you know, get your kids off all drugs, regardless of what the psychiatrist says. I would not say that. Uh, everyone, things are complicated. These, these drugs are, are very important and powerful, especially short term. Um, but we certainly, but an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. And there's now research evidence that if you give kids more play, more freedom and free play in childhood, they're less anxious by the time they're in middle school. So the most well, effective let's, let's close it by bringing up our, play. Our, our friends across the water, the Chinese Communist Party, have now banned uh, cell phone use after 10 p.m. for teenagers. Why are they doing that, Jonathan? Well, so of course, it's an authoritarian country. They can do whatever they want. There are no civil rights. Um, but they are engaged in a what they see as an existential struggle with the United States. And as for whether TikTok is deliberately manipulated by the Chinese Communist Party, or at least TikTok, uh, the American version of TikTok is, is so terrible, whether that's deliberate or just that's what happens, I, I don't know. I can't weigh in on that. I've heard arguments either way. But what we do know is that the Chinese Communist Party tells Doyen or you know, the Chinese company, they say, here, are the, here what, here's what you have to do here in China for domestic consumption. And so it's lots of patriotic stuff. And you look, what do kids in China say they want to be? An astronaut or something like that. And that's what they see on TikTok. Uh, you ask kids in America, what do you want to be? An influencer on TikTok An or, influencer. or Instagram. Yeah. Oh so, um, you know, I, uh, of course, we can't, there are many things we can't do. And thank God I live in a country where the government can't just do that. Uh, but this is our challenge. Democracy is always messy, disorganized, and slow to adapt. Authoritarianism is always fast and direct and strong. And in each era, like in the 1930s, the West was a mess in the Depression. And, you know, Germany and Italy, they were marching forward. The Soviets were marching forward. So there's always a, an appeal of authoritarianism. And in the short run, they can get better results. So far, in the long run, democracy is the only thing that's been shown to work. I'm so glad I live in a liberal democracy. But this is our moment of challenge because it isn't clear to me that American democracy is going to survive the chaos that social media brings when we can't have shared facts when every little dispute can become a big thing so that left and right really hate each other, when you have blue states and red states literally passing laws to punish other states, this is insane. And this is happening because everyone gets so hyped up from social media outrage. So if we're going to win this contest with China, I think we've got to get a handle on what's happening to us. Amen, amen. I cannot improve on that, so I won't. Uh, the Anxious Generation comes out in March. You can pre-order it now, but you can go and read. Get phones out of school now, and you can send it to your school board members and give it to your teachers. Don't be a jerk about it. Just start the conversation and try and get people to pay attention to people like John. If they're on the left, if they're on the right, they can pay attention to me. Jonathan Height, thank you so much for joining me. Come back when the book is out, and we'll have a long conversation about all of it. Uh, good luck to you. Press on. Thanks so much, Hugh. What a pleasure talking with you.